Good evening, grave robbers, and welcome back to the television graveyard. We are your TV necromancers, Lara Prince and Noah Houlihan. We have come here tonight to examine the spirits of television shows which... Brassy month's over. Yeah, we're back in the mausoleum. But... That's uh, what our patrons wanted. Just when I think I'm out, they draw me back in. I'm back in. With me, as always, is TV's Noah Woolahan. If I could just stop smoking drugs. Smoking drugs? <sighs> uh, we are doing Dear Evan Hansen. As the, voted on by our patrons. Which was nominated for numerous Razzies, but didn't get to uh, the big prize. Yes. And uh, we decided to cover it anyway. Yeah, so here we are covering it anyway. This is Dear Evan Hansen. The movie that we've now seen twice. <laughs> yes. Uh, the story behind this is this was my birthday party. Yes. Literally my birthday party that year was seeing Dear Evan Hansen in a private theater with a few of our friends. I wish we could bring more people. I wish we recorded it because it was a magical evening. So we watched it once in a private theater and then once at home for the show. So let's pour one out. I have the Connor Murphy Memorial Orchard. Okay. Uh, because Connor comes from money, it is champagne. Ah. And apple juice, because the uh, the apple orchard is like a huge plot point. Gotcha. A little champagne and apple juice. That looks lovely. Yeah, it's like a mimosa. Nice. Uh, I have the Connor, the, okay. the Connor Murphy. Uh, it is a vodka cranberry that I've also put a little bit of pineapple juice into to kind of fruiten it up. And then uh, just to kind of give it a little bit more kick, I put a little bit of gin in it. Um, no. What, what do you mean? That's a beer. No, it isn't. That's a can of beer. I know Connor really well. I had a special relationship with Connor, and I know that's the truth. And for you to say otherwise is really insulting. It's a can of beer. No, it's not. I'm not full of lies. So this we is have... really a, t- a cocktail that I just just words fail, words fail. There's nothing I can say. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> it's gonna be a long show, kid. Strap <laughs> in. So we open on Evan writing himself a letter. Yes, we and freaking out. It, we start with uh, basically every episode of Doogie Hauser. Yes. Hello, old people that get that reference, uh, and. Literally the first sin of the movie happens during this moment. And I did not catch it the first time, but man, does this bother me this time. We're trying to establish Dear Evan Hansen as a character. Yes. We're going to call him Dear Evan Hansen the whole time. Just be prepared. Uh, but we're, we're, we're following the RuPaul. Yes, we're going to call him Dear Evan Hansen instead of Evan Hansen. I saw Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway uh-huh. and uh, Ben Platt, who plays Dear... He gave everything. You could see spit coming out, and he was there were tears, and he gave everything he had. We're trying to establish everything about this character, so they're trying to establish like that he's depressed and that he's uh, a bit socially awkward. But what they end up doing is there's a line where he says, Today is going to be an amazing day, and here's why. Mm-hmm. And on, and here's why, it cuts to the pills. Oof. I was like, that is a terrible directing choice. Because it's 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 accidentally painting the picture that the only thing that making the day good is drugs. Yeah. Which is an incorrect assessment of this character. But that's your opening shot. Because he's on a number of meds. Yes. And to be real, they do not seem to be working for him. Yeah. Like, usually, uh, at one point, his mom does ask him if the doctor adjusted his meds. And he's like, no. And I was like, probably should have. Because he's barely functioning. The commentary on meds is very muddled throughout this whole thing that I'm not sure what the point they're trying to make is. The commentary on youth mental illness is muddled at best. We'll get into that a little bit later down the line. But let's let's go in order. Because that's something I want to talk about when we hit um, a later song. Okay. 
But so I we get, want to establish that was the first shot of this film. We get into the first song, Waving Through a Window. Yes. But, so already, I'm mad. Okay. I because, have a list of problems as well, but go ahead. Because and, if, uh, we're talking about Dear Evan Hansen. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the first number is supposed to be Anybody Have a Map. Yes. Which is the two mothers, Connor's, Connor and Zoe's mother and uh, Evan's mother in Distant Duet. Uh, singing about their difficulty uh, connecting to and understanding their young adult children. Right. Nope, we open with Waving Through a Window. Mm-hmm. Which, to me, entirely fair, is probably one of the better known songs. Yes, Because this absolutely. is the one they trotted out for everything. The Tonys, every... The Today Show. Every talk show appearance, they trotted out Waving Through a Window. And later started to do You Will Be Found. Yes. And I think one time for forever. Uh, the, the three songs you can get away with doing. Mm-hmm. So, during Waving Through a Window... Uh, so, one of the key lines in this is, on the outside, always looking in. Every time he's singing Waving Through a Window, he is inside looking out. It's yes! Just basic, weird, lazy <laughs> choice making. Oh, he's on the inside looking out. He's the woman in the window. And then, at one point, he does look straight down the lens. Yes. And I go, please don't. This is not Cats and you are not Dame Judi Dench. Yeah. He changes it into the iconic shirt that we all know from the blue polo shirt. Yes. I I do want to ask. He starts in like a purple striped shirt. Yeah. And he changes into a light blue identical shirt. What was that about? I. (laughs) So his mom like later asks him like, was, uh, why didn't you wear that shirt? And he was like, oh, there's stain on it. Went, it was brand new. Yeah. And he goes, I know, I'm so mad. And I didn't understand this piece at all. Don't understand why he doesn't like the shirt. If he doesn't like the shirt, why he chose a shirt that is so similar. Like, my thought is like, is this his comfort shirt? Like, is this something he find? But then he would, his mother would probably know that. Yeah, it's so weird. Uh, sh- his mom's a nurse and she scolds him for not eating. Uh, they kind of have an argument about how she left him money for takeout. And he never ordered it. She's like, you're a senior in high school. You need to be able to order dinner for yourself. You can do it all online. You don't have to talk to anybody. Okay, well, that's not that's not true, actually, though, because um, the credit card's expired, so you have to meet the delivery person at the door. You know, you have to pay them with cash at the door. You have to greet them. You know, you have to figure out the right, the right, um, the, the proper greeting. So this idea that, like, he's so socially awkward, he can't even, you know, answer the door for dinner and yes. pay a person. She gives him a Sharpie because he's his arm is in a cast. Mm-hmm. And so she gives him a Sharpie and tells him to like, get kids to sign your cast. It's very much like square mom trying. Yes. Which is what anybody have a map uh, really Establish. tries to establish. And it shows more of her uh, perspective mm-hmm. of like, another masterful attempt ends in disaster. Like, she's trying so hard and she can't quite like connect. And they also use it to introduce Connor and Zoe. Right. In the musical. And, like, they have an argument of uh, Cynthia, Connor, and Zoe's mom goes, like, you can't go to school high. And Mm -hmm. Connor goes, oh, then I can't go. We're in agreement. That's a good joke. Yeah. That's a really good joke. Yeah. That would have established so much character that we miss. Yeah. Then there's, I, I do have a note. I do still like the song, though. And toward the end of the song in the last, like... Uh, when he does like the second refrain of waving through a window up through like when you're falling in the forest, he's walking dead down the center of the hallway. Mm -hmm. So everyone's running into him. Yes. And it looks terrible because in a real school, you stick to a side of the hallway. Mm -hmm. On stage, um, I don't know if you've seen the stage version of uh, waving through a window just from watching stuff with me. The stage version is very carefully choreographed. Yeah. Of there is like a certain way everyone is moving and walking. It's extremely organized chaos. Mm -hmm. And Evan tries to join, but he can't quite figure out. And it illustrates that point so much better. Yes. Because he tries a couple times to like walk with other people and he just can't like figure out how to jump in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, spinny camera count number one. Okay. They love this like spinning around the camera Mm -hmm. shot. And then on the last refrain, he opens both gym doors dramatically. Like, 
he flings open the gym doors to, I guess, a first day of school pep rally Mm -hmm. in a way that's very unrealistic for the character. Like, he flings open both gym doors like he is a sophomore girl that just got cast as the lead in the musical. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, it's very, like, Mr. Arnstein! Making an entrance! Yes! There's a a morning pep rally. Yes. And uh, he goes to sit in the AV area with his family friend, Jared. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So before we get into that, I have a list of complaints that I didn't get to. All right, cool. Uh, the, The lyrics are... Tap, tap, tapping on the glass. Yes. Waving through a window. Here's all the things wrong with that. Every time they do the tap, tap, tap part, the camera cuts. I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass. I'm waving through a window. I... Yes. Which is infuriating. Yes. Uh, they try to establish that... Uh, Evan is alone by making him stand on what I called the alone square. Oh, the red. When you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? There's one <laughs> weird red square in the middle of the hallway and Evan just stands on it. And he's just it. standing on it while everyone's moving by him. And I was like, oh no, he's on the alone square. <laughs> he's not allowed to talk to other people. And you know what never happens in this song? He never waves. No, he never there's waves. There's not a single damn wave in the whole song. Yeah, like there's never, in the in the musical, he's attempting to connect. Yes, there's no attempt being made by Evan here. No. That he, wa- like, it would make so much more sense if he waved and got ignored. And also we now have to address, Evan looks too old. Yes. The reason for this is that he's too old. Like, thing is, when you have mu- like when you have high school movies, it is not terribly uncommon mm-hmm. for the actors to be in their twenties. Yeah, that's very very common. Like, if you look up the cast of Riverdale, they were a- they were ranging in age from like twenty to twenty five mm-hmm. when that show starts. Playing sixteen, he is playing seventeen or eighteen. He's playing a senior. He is, I believe, twenty eight at the time of fil- filming. Mm-hmm. He looks thirty five. Yes. Everything he did to look younger backfires horribly. Yes. He, like, kind of has curly hair that he doesn't have in the musical. He tried to lose weight. And he just looks weird and gaunt. Everything he tries to do to look younger actually ages him considerably. Mm. He looks much younger in the stage version when you watch, like, a TV um, shot from the stage version. Yeah. The Tonys were in 2017. Mm -hmm. This filmed in summer of 2020. He's only aged three years, yeah. but has somehow aged 15 years. Yeah, he looks older than me. Yes. And what's crazy to me that I didn't notice the first time is how much of the plot is about him not eating. Yes. So knowing he went on that crash diet <laughs> and then him being like, man, he just doesn't eat. It's like, yeah, you look terrible, man. You need some vitamins. Because like... To contrast, the actress playing Zoe, his love interest, uh, she, at the time of filming, was 24. Excuse me, 23, Mm because it was summer 2020 when this filmed. Uh, The actor playing Connor was 25 at the time of filming. Mm -hmm. So, and then I wanted to look up Jared, because that's the other, uh, Jared and Alana, because it was the other... Jared was, you know, he was long in the tooth, man. He was 26. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I want to point out that Jared, Connor, and Zoe all look like Riverdale high schoolers. Yeah. Now, I will say, um, the actress playing Alana is 19 when she's filming. Mm. So she's still too old to be in high school, but only bare. She's really only playing about a year or two older than yeah. the... Because if Alana is also a senior, then Alana's... Would be usually 18 in most school districts, 17 or 18. So Amanda Stenberg's only playing Mm -hmm. about a year older than their character. So what I'm saying is all of these actors outside of uh, Amanda Stenberg are in their 20s, but everybody looks Riverdale High School. CW show high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ben Platt looks How Do You Do Fellow Kids High School. Yes. Like he looks too old. 
Mm -hmm. And what's frustrating is a lot of it is bad choices. Mm -hmm. Because if he looked exactly like he did in the musical, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah, he could get away with it. Because it's also what the audience would have expected. We would have been like, well, that's what he looks like. You've seen the Tonys. It was jarring because he looks so much different than the Tonys, which were only three years prior. Mm -hmm. Because this did film in the pandemic during the summer of 2020. Yeah. Anyway. I needed to point this out because we're about to have him start interacting with other teenagers. Yes. So Evan is sitting with Jared, who is a family friend, which Mm -hmm. Jared makes sure to mention several times, despite the fact that we never see Jared with other friends. Um, Like Jared has no other friends that we know of, but does not want Evan to think they're friends. Yeah. He does not actually care for him. And Jared makes fun of Evan for having a crush on Zoe Murphy. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you should talk to her. And Evan goes, really? No, you obviously should not talk to her. You're a literal disaster. Yeah, literal disaster. So you get the idea with Jared. It's also like, oh, with friends like these. Mm-hmm. Like, if your only friend is Jared and the dynamic is he's mean to you, it's probably not very helpful for your social development. No, it's not good for your life. And then uh, Alana, who is the class president, takes the stage, starts off with, go Bobcats! Yes, go in Bobcats. In the world's most awkward arm movement. Yes. Well, d- don't forget... This is awesome, but you know what's not awesome? You know what's not phenomenal? Deforestation. Deforestation. <laughs> so awesome, everyone. You know what's not phenomenal? Deforestation. And then my next note. Yeah, Alana's my favorite. Yeah. Uh, protagonist of a movie I actually want to watch. Yeah. I'll, I'll, this is going to be a theme. I'll be talking about her a lot more later. Yeah. Uh, Evan explains to Jared how he broke his arm falling out of a tree. Mm-hmm. And then Jared went to summer camp, put on 13 pounds of muscle, and hooked up with a hot Brazilian dude. Yes. Now, this is a change from the musical. Jared is implied to potentially be gay in the uh, musical. It has become canon in the movie. That he's gay. And then my my note. 13 pounds of muscle and hooked up with a hot Brazilian dude. Good for you, buddy. <laughs> uh, Evan asks Jared to sign his cast, and Jared is kind of too douchey to do it. Yes. And then the orchestra... Please, anybody have a map. Yes. So that if you like the musical, you have a chance to be mad. Yes. It's an Easter egg that only upsets people who get it. And then uh, we get the first interaction with Connor and Evan. Yes. And... If I may. Yes. Because I noticed something here. Connor's at his locker. And three jocks walk by. And one of them who is red-headed, says, uh, you look good, it's school shooter chic. Oh, they keep, they do keep that line. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a Did line you, from the musical. Oh, you missed that line? Uh, yeah, you know, I just never thought they kept that line. It is said by a guy in a letterman jacket with red hair, and the amount of sass that comes off on that line made me go, oh my God, is that Heather Duke? It's not, but it does look just enough like Heather Duke from Paramount Heathers that I did a double take. And then any time that guy is on stage or on screen, my eyes are glued to him. He will not speak again. That is his one line, is school shooter chic, but he's in the rest of the movie. Um, yes, and it's not the first piece that... Um It's not the first piece that is going to bring to mind Heathers. No, certainly not. Um, To the point where I I don't remember the name of the high school, but it's a W. Yeah. And the whole time I was like, it's Westerberg. Yeah. Hey, oh, Westerberg. Um, So, like, it's hard to get these things together. Yes. Um, Uh, At this point, Dear Evan Hansen makes a noise. I wouldn't even think it was a laugh. He just kind of makes a noise. Yeah. And Connor comes up and goes, do you think that's funny? And Evan's like, no. And then he screams, well, then stop laughing. And then shoves Evan against his locker. Mm -hmm. And Evan clearly is like, oh. Yeah. Because now Evan's bullied. And then Zoe goes up to Evan and apologizes. Yes. Uh, She's like, I'm really sorry about my brother. And that's, that's dear Evan Hansen's crush. And now she's talking to him. So he does what anybody would do. And uh, awkwardly 
interact with her. Like, I don't even want to go through this scene. It's so painful. Oh, I will. Okay. Uh, so he, she offers oh, you her hand to him. And he's afraid that his hand is too sweaty. So he, like, awkwardly wipes it on his shirt, mumbles some words, and then Naruto runs away. Oh, yeah. Well, that I was going to make sure we mentioned that. Um, he does a full Naruto run. Uh, like, uh. like, whatever you're picturing, more. More Naruto than that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really funny if you add a whoop, 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 whoop. As he's running. Yes. It's yes to that. Unbelievable at this point. And like, if you went in here not knowing anything about this, you could conceivably believe this is going to be a really funny musical. Yes. Like, <laughs> a, and you could totally bring yourself to think it's going to be a very um, Heather's dark comedy. Yeah. Like, so then. Evan's still trying to write the letter, which we have established is something his therapist asks him to do. Yes, he writes letters to himself. To Dear Evan Hansen, signed me. Sincerely me, yeah. Sincerely me. And I kind of miss exactly what he writes in this letter. But it's basically, Dear Evan Hansen, uh, I'm feeling really insecure. If I could just talk to Zoe... No, um, dear Evan Hansen, it turns out this wasn't an amazing day after all. This isn't going to be an amazing week or an amazing year, because why would it? Oh, I know, because there's Zoe, and all my hope is pinned on Zoe, who I don't even know and doesn't know me, but maybe if I did, maybe if I could just talk to her, then maybe, maybe nothing would be different at all. I wish everything was different. I wish that I was part of something. I wish that anything I said mattered to anyone. I mean, face it, would anyone notice if I disappeared tomorrow? Sincerely, your best and most dearest friend, me. Right. So he he writes this and prints it out at um, school. Yes. Uh, what it's are 20 you doing? Tw- and like, it's 2020. Why wouldn't you just email this to your therapist? Yeah. Um, why, why even waste paper on this? And we see the like all the, sh- we see him go through his day and all the like little shitty injustices of being in high school and yeah. unpopular like. He eats lunch alone. He gets, yeah. like, bumped in the, uh, in line. Yeah. And then, like, we see him changing for gym, and yeah. he's, like, really awkward, and everybody else is just kind of Everyone chilling. else is a model. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's also that. <laughs> uh, everyone else in his gym class is athletic and attractive. Yeah, is an Abercrombie and Finch model. So, he writes, basically, a miserable note and prints it on the school computer. And after he hits print, uh, Connor... Asks, Connor's sitting in the library at the same time. And he goes, what happened to your arm? And Evan's like, I fell out of a tree. And Connor goes, that's the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Evan gets up and you see a moment of Connor remorseful. Yeah. And then you realize Connor is attempting to connect with Evan. Yes. Because he feels bad about the hallway. Mm-hmm. He and should have waved. Yeah. This whole damn show is based off of waving, and it never happens. And then Connor follows Evan into line for the printer. Evan tries to, like, push past people, and he's like, I I printed something, and the girl in front of him is like, we all did. Wait your turn. That's how a printer works. (laughs) And uh, Connor grabs a marker and goes like, let me sign your cast so we can both pretend we have friends. And then Connor... My next note is big old B for birthday. <laughs> he reminds me of that John Mulaney joke. Yeah. He signs his name over the entire cast. He signs it the way a douchebag signs your yearbook. Yes. We're like, yeah, sign my yearbook. And then they sign it so big. It's like, I have other people that I wanted to sign this, you asshole. You speaking from experience? Yes. Um, <laughs> so then... Uh, Connor finds Evan's letter on the printer, recognizes his sister's name on it, Mm. and accuses Evan of provoking him. Yes. And takes the letter. Which, this is is kind of interesting foreshadowing. Mm Mm-hmm. Connor's first reaction is, are you trying to make it look like I wrote this? Yeah. Like, are you trying to provoke me with this? And that's just kind of interesting. And then... uh, Dear Evan Hans is like, please give it back. And Connor pushes him down like he's a tree. 
it's that'll be funny later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Evan's like, please just don't show anyone that letter. And Connor storms out. With the letter. With the letter, right. Still has it. So, uh, then, oh, my next note is, Connor! Because uh, that's what Evan yells. He yells, Connor! Uh, and then he, Evan panics, runs to the bathroom, spills his meds everywhere. On the bathroom eats, floor. And eats a high school, eats what I call a high school men's room Xanax. And I said, well, you don't have to worry about anxiety now. You're going to die something else. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, rinse it or something. Right? And again, this is kind of playing off that, like, this seems almost like, and, and excuse me for using this language, junkie behavior. Like, the fact that this has fallen onto the bathroom floor of a, a boy's high school bathroom is not enough to deter him from eating it. So it's like, what is your commentary on this medication right now? Yes. Again, it's that mixed commentary about the medication. Of like, it's not a great moment for Evan. It would, in another film, be a character bottoming out. Yeah. And I offer this question to you. What is the purpose of this scene? Uh, To show Evan really having a panic attack because he's afraid that Connor's going to post the letter somewhere. Correct. The ne- the rest of the scene, like the next couple scenes, is him on Reddit and Facebook desperately trying to see if searching it's posted his, anywhere. Yeah, searching his he own searches name. searches his own name, all this other stuff. If you're doing that, do you need the bathroom scene? No. What is the purpose of this scene other than to make it look like drugs are the worst thing? Like, uh, the messaging of this film is so confusing. So, uh, he calls his mom, and his mom is taking an extra shift. She's worried about losing her job. Yes, because there's budget cuts at the hospital. Which I was like, this is filmed in 2020. They weren't firing nurses for anything. (laughs) This is true. Like, as long as she did not, like, as long as she didn't straight up stab somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, there were nurse shortages. But this is also, COVID is not part of this at all. Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, Evan tells Jared about it, and Jared is like, oh yeah, he's totally going to post it on the internet. Yes. And they subtly mention, like... Connor hasn't been to school in three days. He hasn't been in school in three days. And then just, like, magic. Well, they also establish Connor threw a printer at a teacher in second grade because he couldn't be line leader. Can you imagine what he's going to do to you? Yes. Which is a great line. (laughs) So, uh, here's the content warning for Dear Evan Hansen. We are going to talk about some um, difficult themes. Mm -hmm. And like Heather's, this movie does not handle them well. No. So... Things are going to be discussed that are not handling things very sensitively. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if this is a very sensitive topic for you, uh, this might not be the episode for you. Yes, thanks for joining us (laughs) if you need to sign off here. Yeah, like if you need to go, we'll we'll see you for Clerks the Animated Series next week. That's not what we're doing. Clerks the Live Action Series (laughs) next week. Spoilers. We tell them at the end anyway. (laughs) So until then, stay doomed. We love you. Yes. If you're cool with sticking around, great. So, uh, Evan gets called to the principal's office. And the principal's like, oh, Connor Murphy's parents want to talk to you. And Evan is clearly crapping a brick. Yes. Which, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like, getting called to the principal's office, no matter what, is scary in high school. Yeah. And if you're Evan, and it's the person who stole your letter, Mm -hmm. like, your essentially, like, very intimate letter about themselves... It's Connor's parents who are played uh, by Amy Adams and a man. (laughs) (laughs) Oh no, there's real, there's real celebrities named Larry Murphy. (laughs) Shice. Huh. Larry Murphy is the name of an actor who plays um, Teddy on Bob's Burgers. Oh. Bonus Larry Murphy related fact today. (laughs) Sorry, I need to pull up. Take your time. The actor playing Larry Murphy. Because Amy Adams is a name and I can't remember the name of Larry. Larry. Where's Larry? Okay, Danny Pino. So his uh, parents are played by Amy Adams and Danny Pino. Yes. Or we're going to call them Cynthia and Larry because those are the characters' names. And they hand him a note. And then Larry says, these are his last words. Yeah. Connor took his own life. 
And Evan, for one of the only times in the movie, responds completely appropriately by going, he what? Yeah. And then he he tries to go, like, Connor didn't write this, Connor didn't write this. He tries to come clean. And Larry's like, he's in shock. Yeah. Because they just kind of, like, in their minds, they've just dropped this bomb that uh, this boy died by suicide and his note is to you, a person we don't know. Yes. Uh. And... Uh, so he tries to give the letter back to Cynthia, and when doing so, his arm, his cast comes a little bit out of his sleeve. She grabs his arm. She grabs his broken arm. Yeah. And sees the signed cast. And it says Connor. So she's like, "Oh, the, he did have a secret friend." I think this might be an appropriate time to discuss the characterization of Dear Evan Hansen as possibly on the spectrum. Okay. Because. Uh, there's an acting choice to do this kind of like fidgeting thing with his fingers, Mm -hmm. which kind of reads on the spectrum. Okay. And they don't do a good job of establishing that the reason uh, Evan doesn't tell the truth is that he doesn't want them to feel bad. It's truly that he is not confident, confident enough to use human language. Okay. Because his response to this is, oh, no, I, 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 you don't know. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what? And the idea that he's just unable to speak clearly yes. when dealing with other people, like, drives kind of past anxious. Yeah. Into a, a level of there being some sort of, like, other issue at play. Okay. This again falls into that kind of woman in the window, uh, big bang theory category of, or, or um, what's the one I want to say? The, the fanatic category where we are never going to say this character is on the spectrum. We're just going to play that he's on the spectrum the whole time, but we don't want to address it. Because we don't want... To show that we didn't handle it well. Yes. And so we can say that you're projecting. Yeah. This is becoming my least favorite trope of all the stuff we're watching. Is when someone on the spectrum is just handled so poorly. Or pretending like they're not on the, the spectrum. They're just weird. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> Hate this. Hate this. So we then see him sitting at lunch and we watch news get around. Yes. And it's like, the way they handle that in this movie is everyone's phone goes off at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's high school, there's texts, but they're still dealing in whispers. Yes. I also, I really need to stress this as well. It's so funny. Just the way that, like, he gets cut off when he mumbles and stuff like that. The whole, like, it's a comedy of errors. Yeah. That's leading to all this. It's so hard not to laugh at this and take it seriously. And it's supposed to be serious. Yeah. But it's so funny. (laughs) Why did they make it so funny? So, uh, Alana goes up and gives Evan her condolences, and then people are, like, taking selfies in front of Connor's locker. Yes, and by people, you mean Heather Duke. Yes, and... And I was just like, that is such a Heather Duke thing to say, to do, is take that selfie. And he does duck lips. He does. (laughs) I was just like, is that Heather Duke? So, Evan goes to Zoe's house. He goes to the Murphy's house on uh, their parents' invitation. And Cynthia begs for anything, anything he has of Connor. And Zoe's like... Yeah, the only time I ever saw you two together, he was screaming in your face. I love that she doesn't believe him. That there needed to be more of that. And then Cynthia tries to bully Evan into saying there were good things about Connor. And then, like, they talk about this orchard and this ice cream place. And then Evan is a low-rate mentalist. Yes, that's exactly what I have written here. Is he does a bad Jonathan Edwards cold read. Yes, because he takes the Alamode and the orchard. And he spins it into a song called For Forever. Yes. Uh, it really plays like an unrequited love song. Mm-hmm. And we see Evan fall out of the tree, but in the fantasy sequence, uh, Connor scoops up Evan 
and yes. like helps get him to safety after he breaks his arm. And so he's singing about this really wonderful day they had at the end of May or early June mm-hmm. in the apple orchard together, just hanging out. And it plays like an unrequited love song. Yes. Uh, important things I would like to note. Okay. One. Evan's the only one who sings, but the other characters still respond to the things that are being said. Like, they talk questions to him, and then he sings them back, which is so weird. Yeah, because the only two songs we've gotten at this point are Waving Through a Window and For Forever. So weird. Uh, One of the lyrics is about how uh, they they talk about the girls we wish would notice us. But never do. But never do. But then the next line is Connor says, there's nowhere I'd rather be. And at this point I was like, why doesn't anyone think they're gay? (laughs) Because the only person that says that is Jared. Jared's like, they're going to think you're a gay couple. And my response... They think you were lovers. You realize that? Yeah. I don't know why no one does. Because it like, if they're not gay... Why is their friendship a secret? Yeah. Like, there's no explanation on why they felt like they needed to hide their friendship. You would think it's because they're plowing each other. Yeah, you would think that, like, they're in, they're two young men uh, in a high school relationship mm-hmm. that are not out to their parents yet. Yes. Like, they spend would... time in a closed apple orchard. <laughs> Yes, like this very much reads like a secret relationship. Yes! It's so weird that no one has that thought. Uh, We also, two things that we see that I cannot get over are we see Evan running. And we should never see Evan running. Evan runs like Phoebe from Friends or a six-year-old. Where the arms just windmill the whole time? <laughs> like, it's so awkward. Look what I can do. And then we see him fall out of the tree. Evan falls out of the tree and hits the ground like a family guy character. Like, with the legs twisted and the one arm behind his back for no reason. That's the position he lands. And it's hilarious. It's shot very poorly. Like, you see him bounce when he hits the ground. It's, like, it's very funny. It's something that we don't usually see because, like, physics is not as dramatic looking as we would want it to be sometimes. It was probably a very realistic, like, it's probably what you would look like if you fell out of a tree. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look cool. It doesn't look dramatic. So it doesn't. It really could have just been a discretion shot. It's in slow motion. That, that is true. I tried, <laughs> so guys. you can see him bounce off the ground. I, tr- I tried. It's so, so funny. <laughs> it's very poorly directed. Yes. So, Cynthia is enraptured with this little fairy tale and hugs Evan, who is so attention-starved he accepts it. And then we get the next day... The next thing Jared says, they think you were lovers. You realize that? Yes. And then my next note, no and Laura sure did. Yeah. (laughs) And then uh, Evan pleads with Jared to help him fake more emails uh, from from Connor so he can fake the friendship. And we get a great little scene of Jared going, $2,000 an email. Yeah. And he's like, no. That's a floor, not a ceiling. (laughs) $1,500. Evan's like, I can give you 20 bucks. Done but I'm not going to be happy about it. And then we get one of the only truly enjoyable musical numbers in this movie. If, if we had kept this tone for the rest of the film, this would be an incredible movie. Colton Ryan earns his money here. Yes. Cause he is, he leads the song sincerely me. Yeah. Where he's kind of singing in like almost puppet form all of the emails that Jared and Evan are writing. Yes. Including things where, like, Jared implies they're gay. Yeah. And then, like, Evan doesn't know how kids talk. Yeah. So he says things like, If I stop smoking drugs, then everything might be alright. Smoking drugs. Just fix it. 
If I stop smoking crack, crack, if I stop smoking pot, then everything might be all right. And Connor's charismatic and Colton Ryan does a great job. He does dancing. He like jumps on a table in the library. It's really like kind of a fun, dark comic musical number. Oh, yeah. And like, it's all the things that Evan and Connor would have done if they were really friends. So it shots of them like going go-karting and sharing a go-kart. And playing DDR together. Yes. They're playing Pump It Up. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Pump, yeah. DDR is up, down, left, right. Pump It Up is up, left, and right, down, left, and right, and center. There are five buttons instead of four. And they actually, for some of it, do fit the pump it up into the choreography. Yes. Which is pretty cool. It's not as good when Ben Platt joins in. Like, <laughs> the second verse when Evan comes in, it's definitely not as good. Well, I do want to say... Because he's such a dweeb. I do want to say, you say that he's basically a puppet. Connor sounds like Kermit the Frog in this. Dear Evan Hansen, we've been way too out of touch. Things have been crazy and it sucks that we don't talk that much. Okay. Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> yeah, because I think there's supposed to be something fake to his voice. Because he's not really Connor. True. He's Jared and Evan talking through Connor. Yes. And I think this is a good time to bring this up. You told me about a cut song. Yes. This is the song Disappear. Sincerely Me is in the show before Disappear. Okay. But we should still talk about the song Disappear. Okay. Because in the musical, uh, Disappear's a couple songs later. But it's a song about Connor. And it's Connor pleading with Evan to not let his memory die. Uh, No one deserves to be forgotten. No one deserves to fade away. No one should come and go and have no one know he was never even there. Uh, No one deserves to disappear, to disappear, to disappear. Losing this song really hurts both characters. Absolutely. Because right now, like that song, even though it's not really Connor speaking to Evan, we see the justification that Evan thinks what he's doing is doing right by Connor. Yeah. We lose the idea that what he's doing is right by Connor immediately in this. So now it's just selfish or awkward reasons? Like, it's too awkward to not do these things? And in Disappear, Connor has, when you're fallen in a forest and there's nobody around, all you want is for someone to find you. When you're fallen in a forest and when you hit the ground, all you need is someone to find you. So kind of... Now, it's been debated in the Dear Evan Hansen fandom if the Connor who sings in Disappear is a ghost or a figment of Evan's imagination. Either way... It's the way Evan can convince himself. Yes. That he's that this lie is the right way to go. So, going back to where we are, uh, they come up with some more emails, and Cynthia reads all the emails and just laps them up, mm. and Larry and Zoe do not want to. The mood whiplash from this, because we go from this very fun song Like, a song that I will catch myself humming. Yeah. To Zoe telling her mom, when Connor was high on drugs, I took the bus by myself to pick him up when I was 12 and gave him money, and he used it to buy more drugs and didn't come home. It's like, oh, Jesus. Yes. We were in an arcade two minutes ago, and now we're in the gutter downtown with a 12-year-old girl. Yeah, like, oh, you know, Connor told me he was too afraid to talk to you and that he wanted to see me, so I took the bus downtown. And all he wanted was money, and I gave it to him because I was 12. Yeah, like... And we get the impression that she's uh, younger, but she's probably still only, like, 16. Yes. This, like, it's such a painful moment where I was just like, all right, so much for this being fun. And if you have addiction in your family, this part is really rough. She also, like, says, like, oh, well, what about the time he punched through my door saying he was going to kill me for no reason? Yes. And so Zoe's problem now is that, like, he was kind and vulnerable to Evan, Mm -hmm. but never to her. Yes. And that's when we get the song Requiem. 
Mm-hmm. I love this song. It's a good um, song, but it is the complete op- opposite to sincere- Sincerely Me. Yes, Excuse like, me. the key to Requiem is, you know, when she says, like, she when she's kind of thinking of, like, but when the villains fall, the kingdoms never weep. Like, she's refusing to grieve. Yes. And then she starts to freak out, and she slams on her uh, gas pedal, flying down the street in the middle of the night, Mm -hmm. and says, like, don't tell me that I didn't have it right. Don't say that it was only black and white. Don't say it wasn't true that you were not the monster that I knew. Mm -hmm. So this idea of, like, it was easier to be angry at Connor when she could see him as just her abuser. Yeah. But seeing this third dimension to Connor is really messing with her. Yes. And right when she hits a red light, she slams her brake and survives. Yes. But we see this moment of, uh, this theme through here is these moments of rash, very teenage, self-destructive acts. This is not the first one we see, because you can argue the first one we see is uh, what Connor does and Connor's dying by suicide. And then Evan's song for forever could be seen as a rash, desperate act. Uh, Zoe... Reckless driving is a rash, desperate act. Yes. I have one major problem with this, though. She gets it up to, like, 90 miles an hour. Then she slams the brakes right before hitting a red red light. And no cars go by. So it wouldn't have mattered. So it wouldn't have mattered. Like, so much could have been said by, like, she stops because she realized her life wouldn't be the only one that was ruined. Yeah. and If she saw, like, a a a school bus go by or something. Yeah. And, like, I'm better than him because I'm not letting my shit bother other people. But instead, she's the only car on the road. Yeah, like, it doesn't really prove a point outside of nobody's on the road this time of day, I guess. Terribly directed. So, we get another scene with Evan and her, uh, Evan and his mother. And his mother is handing him all of these essay contests to get scholarships for college. And she's worried. And she points out, like, it says Connor on your cast. And he kind of says, like, oh, people are writing Connor on things as, like, a memorial. Yes. So he lies to his mom about the lie he's telling. (laughs) Yeah. And so Alana is trying to drum up a memorial for a fallen student. Mm -hmm. And she sits down by Evan and was like, you guys were friends, right? Like, don't you want to help me with this? Uh, I saw you talking, like, the day before he passed away. And I would have the thought of, like, if he was seen screaming in Evan's face the, right before he died, in a high school, the narrative would be they had a fight and that caused it. Yeah. Because, like, kids are not the kindest people. Well, her rationale is something like, I knew him too. We did Catcher in the Rye together in 10th grade. Yeah, they, like, had done a project together. And, like, she kind of mentions, like, he was rough to work with. Yeah. So I thought that was her trying to relate with Evan. Yeah, like someone else trying was, to connect. Yeah, I was friends with him too. He's tough to be friends with. Yeah. So like I kind of get this. Kind of. If I force it. <laughs> so then Evan gets home for the day and he and his mom were going to do Taco Tuesday and his mom stands him up. Yes. To take a shift at the hospital. Yes, because they need money. We establish that Evan's dad is out of the picture and that Evan's, like, taking the bus because he doesn't have a car. So he takes the bus to Zoe's house. And he looks so much older than she does in this scene. So much older. Like, they're not... They're not even, like, ten years apart, but they look ten years apart in this scene. And they talk about, like, how... Her mom's, like, been into different things, like Buddhism and... uh, Now everything's gluten-free. Yeah, like, how her mom kind of jumps around from fad to fad. You know what's not gluten-free? What? Tate's cookies. Oh, I got the impression that they were not for her, that they were for... We noticed that there's Tate's cookies in 
the uh Because that's shorthand for they're wealthy. Yeah, because they bought the fancy cookies. <laughs> so we're like, oh, there's Tate's cookies again. And now every time we see Tate's cookies, we're like, like ooh, fancy, fancy people cookies. They got Tate cookies. And there is a moment where he's like, oh, my mom's never done that. And she goes, your mom's never been rich. And he's drinking water and kind of mutters into his water glass, your mom's never been poor. Yes. And it's the most relatable moment for Evan. Yes, because it's the only time he's not stumbling like he's Woody Allen. Yeah, like it's this moment where like, your mom's never been poor. Oh, 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 oh my God. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. I'm so, oh God. Mm. And so. That was my Woody Allen. <laughs> I, I just tried to gloss over it. Uh, Zoe talks about like, so did Connor ever mention me? And then we get the worst seduction song that has ever been. Go ahead and I'll freak out later. We get If I Could Tell Her, Mm -hmm. which is a song about, like, all the things Connor loved about his sister, but it's really all the things Evan has noticed about Zoe. Mm -hmm. And, like, if I'm Zoe, I would have been like, oh, these are all things that are, like, really public knowledge about me. Like... Yes and no. Because the first one is... uh, He liked, and he's talking about Connor, even though he's talking about himself, that when you play the guitar, you smile like you just heard a joke, but it's a secret. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of your way of telling the joke. It's it's like a kind of cute thing to say. Yeah. But then he starts saying stuff like... And he knew whenever you get bored, you scribble stars on the cuffs of your jeans. And he noticed that you still fill out the quizzes that they put in those teen magazines. I do that ironically. And I was like, yo, that's a weird thing for Evan to know. Yeah. About your crush. That you've never spoken to. Like, it's so creepy. (laughs) Like, I was like, it's weird that you know that. Let, like, if her brother knew that, sure, and then her brother told you. But that's not true. That means you've just been staring at this woman as she looked at an Us magazine. Yeah. You're a creep, and you're old. Yeah, and, like, my next note is, you do not love her, you love a concept. Yes. And then uh, Zoe's parents come home, and they have, like, a goofy little moment as a family where, like, Larry makes a dad joke. Yes. No way. Because it's uh, non-dairy protein. Yeah. No way. Get it? Dad, are you ever going to stop with that joke? Nope. It's a great joke. I wrote it down. I actually really like that joke. Yeah. They have a goofy little moment as a family, and Evan is clearly getting something he needs out of this. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we then get... Yeah, it's very clear in that they're establishing in this moment that what Evan's getting out of this lie is he finally gets the family he's always wanted. Yeah. A dad, because he doesn't have a dad. A mom that's there that cares. And a sister he wants to bang. Yeah. (laughs) That's the real plot! (laughs) My next note. Uh, They go... We see Evan in his room. And Evan has Ben Folds and Radiohead posters. Do the youth listen to Ben Folds and Radiohead? Uh, no. <laughs> like, this supports the Evan secretly a 40-year-old dude. Yeah. Because, like, the music is not current. But it's also not, like... I like Ben Folds and Radiohead a lot, but it's not, like, the classic. Yeah. If you had, like, the Beatles or... Like the Foo Fighters. The, yeah, the Foo Fighters. Who've been popular for, like, 25 years. Nirvana. Mm-hmm. Like, the ones that you can have that are timeless. Yes. Um, so then Alana texts him and meets him in the middle of the night. And she pitches the Connor Project for Mental Health Outreach. Mm-hmm. And the next thing we see is uh, how this movie treats anxiety in women versus anxiety in men. Because Alana is direct. She's a high achiever. Mm-hmm. And she goes like, what are you on? And he's like, excuse me? She goes like, oh, I'm on Lexapro. Yeah. What do you want? All right. I'll tell you what. I'll go first. I'm on Lexapro. And then I realized who this is. This is Missy from Big Mouth. Oh, I was going to... It's not the voice actor, but like, this is who Missy grows up to be. I was going to say, no, she's Rue from The Hunger Games. (laughs) 
<laughs> because that's who the actress actually, actually is. Yeah. But the way she talks and she's very excited and the way that she kind of dresses and <laughs> what's important to her, she's very much Missy from Big Mouth. He's on Zoloft and Wellbutrin and Ativan, he takes off the bathroom floor. <laughs> Blows on it first. And she goes, depression? Anxiety? Yes. And then... Uh, we see an added song called The Anonymous Ones. They added a song for Alana. And she kind of sings a song about how a lot of people are struggling. Yes. To me, this is really interesting on a lot of levels. One, we see the entire first day of school sequence leading up to the pep rally from her point of view. Yes. Right to the point where she even passes Evan in his misery square. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you stay on the lonely square. <laughs> <laughs> but... We also kind of see this thing of uh, the way this treats mental illness in men versus women of like men are underachieving loners when they have mental illness Mm -hmm. and women are overachievers and still outgoing. Yes. And me. Oh, hey, according to this, if you have anxiety, you have no friends. Yeah. Because none of the characters depicted as having any kind of mental health issues have any real friends. No, they have zero friends. Which is not true and really offensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, in- and they clearly have one line from this film, they re- this song yes. they really like. Because they mention, uh, the parts we can't tell, we carry them well, but that doesn't mean they're not heavy. She repeats this line four or five times now and four or five times in like half an hour. Yes. Then in one of the greatest moments of accidental comedy, they're sitting on the swings during this song, and Evan finally reaches his hand out. He overcomes the fact that he's got sweaty-ass hands and actually wants to make a human connection with this person. And she puts a flyer in his hand. <laughs> I was like, I'm not holding that sweaty hand. Here, read my literature. <laughs> so, we get that little moment, and we then... Uh, Alana successfully convinces Evan to speak at the memorial. And uh, Cynthia, Evan goes to the Murphy's house again. Cynthia takes Evan to Connor's room. And we kind of get like Evan, like there's holes Connor punched in the wall. Mm-hmm. And in a punching bag that was clearly like. Yeah, speed bag. His parents being like, punch this. Yeah. And uh, Cynthia tells Connor, or excuse me. Cynthia tells Evan a story about she bought this tie when Connor was going into eighth grade and everyone was going to have their bar mitzvahs and he didn't get invited to a single one. So kind of this, like, Cynthia does not realize how uh, isolated Connor really was. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we see Evan straight up shaking before he speaks. Yeah, because now... And Jared is shocked. Jared does not realize Evan's going to be speaking. And Jared knows the truth, remember? Yeah, so now he actually has to give a speech. His whole body is vibrating. He goes up there, and he's like, Hello, uh, students and faculty. And, like, the mic feeds back. Jared's at the soundboard and does not help him. Nope. (laughs) I did not catch that until the second time where it was like, he's too busy just sitting there being a jerk to like, oh, I should turn this down a touch for my friend, family friend. So Jared then says what everyone is thinking. Holy shit. (laughs) Like, and he starts giving a speech and it's a disaster. He drops his cue cards. He knocks over the mic and then people start pulling out cell phones which when you think about it, mm-hmm. in the narrative that everyone believes, they are filming a mourning child at a memorial to mock him. Yeah. Who would do that? I'll tell you who would do that. It's the Westerberg boys. Heather Duke. <laughs> Heather Duke is the first person they show pulling out their phone. And I, I think this is kind of realistic. Like, this is what you would do when you see a disaster. <laughs> Is that you You start filming it. Uh, I have a note that Evan sounds like uh, Onyx the Vesuvius. Like, I was friends with Connor and now he's dead. I don't know. Seems pretty cool. <laughs> oh my god. That's, that's pretty funny. So then, 
He knocks over the microphone, and the microphone is still on the floor as the music starts for You Will Be Found. Yes. And this makes me think of my dear friend, Maddie. Yes. Because Maddie, when we saw this in the theater, went, no one can hear you. No one can hear you. Just the idea that he's standing on the stage, and all you hear is, even when the dark is passing through, we can't can't hear you. (laughs) Speak up. Shirane, <laughs> speak up. Uh, so then you catch this, and I love it. People start filming it with their cell phones, and tell me what you caught because you had a good eye on this. <laughs> Everyone starts taking out their phone, fel- their cell phones to to film it, and in the shot where they're filming it, you can see that the audio bars are barely moving. So in the canon. The phones are not picking up Evan singing. <laughs> you will be found. You will be found. You will be found. So, yeah. <laughs> it's such an easy thing to fix. Oh my god, it was this this whole scene is unbelievable. So, We're only halfway through it. <laughs> so this goes um So this goes mega mega viral. Mhm. And we get these little like moments where it's clearly like, "Oh, it's had this many views this morning and this many views." And this is one of the biggest songs from the show. This is yeah. You Will Be Found um it was rated as one of the top 20 show tunes of all time by Radio 1 recently. Really? Uh, yes. It's interesting because when it was originally written, it was actually supposed to be kind of tongue-in-cheek from what the musical was originally supposed to be about. Okay. But then as the musical evolved, it gets played completely straight. Uh, it's a nice song. It is a nice song. But what they do here is some of the most unforgivable things. You see it go viral, so you see a bunch of other people talking. And respect to those people, because as you told me, those are real fans, right? Yes. There there are people who love Dear Evan Hansen during quarantine that like filmed the little thing for this. Yes. However, one of the kids says, Take five minutes. It'll make your day. You gotta see this video. It'll make your day. And just the idea of being like, this video of this kid talking about his friend who committed suicide made my day better. (laughs) Just the phrasing of that is funny. But nowhere near as bad as what happens next. As we see more and more uh, faces Uh. popping up saying how great this is. And there's more and more. And they fill up the whole screen and they form a mosaic of Connor's face. It's all a lie, though. It shouldn't make Connor because this isn't Connor. No. <laughs> this is like the lie version of Connor. What are they doing? <laughs> um, and the mosaic is so cheesy, it's terrible. It's so ter- It's unbelievable what they pull off here. But then we kind of get like, we find out that Larry had not mourned at all. He hadn't cried at the funeral. And then we see him leave work, come home, and finally break down. Zoe looks on stricken. And she approaches Alana and finally takes, like, a Connor Project button. Mm-hmm. And then, like, Evan suddenly is social media famous. There are flowers in front of Connor's locker. Everyone waves to Evan. Everyone waves at Evan! You hit it! Yes. People legitimately start waving. And Evan is too awkward to do anything. Evan never waves in the whole movie! And people oh, wave at him! Oh, you spit so much on me just now! I'm sorry. Oh. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm that was so, so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, that was so gross. <laughs> <sighs> I'm too I'm I'm too sorry about spitting to be upset now. But 
The whole opening was about how Evan was waving through a window and no one was waving back. He never waves in that song and he never waves back when people actually wave at him the thing that he wanted. Guys, what are we doing? So then Zoe's crying on her porch and Evan awkwardly clatters up to her and she cries. Yes. End of act one. This would be intermission in the uh, show. Yes. So then uh, we then get a shot of Evan getting his cast removed. Yes. Which is actually usually done during intermission. That makes sense. Um, Because it is a new cast every night in the Broadway musical, which I think is interesting. Uh, in the one, in one of the makeup or dressing rooms, there's just a line of casts because every night, I believe they auction them off from time to time because mm-hmm. they use a, a new one every night because they really do put one on, not like a real cast cast, but like they put something on the actor playing Evan and then they have to take it off every day in an intermission and they're not reusable. Right. It's interesting. So it's also a way to show that time has passed. Right. And we get to the first official meeting of the Connor Project. And it's huge. It's it's very realistic, this piece. Yeah. Because, like, something just happened. There was just a tragedy and everyone's on board. Mm-hmm. And after the meeting, Evan has an anxiety attack and eats a bathroom floor out of Anne. Well, he also throws up. Yes. I don't actually think he takes an out of Anne this yeah. time. I think it's just, it looks like the same scene to me. Yes. Uh, they're probably shot the same day. Uh, but basically, the big announcement here is they're going to try to raise $100,000 so that they can... Take the orchard that Evan and Connor fell in love in and reopen it and make it beautiful again. And then, but in the, um, uh, the next thing, we do have another cut song here. And I kind of think it's interesting. Uh, there's a Sincerely Me reprise. Oh, really? That's not in this. We're in more fabricated emails... Jared starts to put himself in. Oh, this is interesting. Because now it's like Jared wants the clout. Hmm. So this thing that makes like Jared almost an antagonist is this plot point is ultimately cut from. Because I will say this. I think one of the big things that's missing here is an antagonist. We get into it a little bit later, but there should be someone that doubts uh, Evan's story immediately. Because as an audience member, that would do a thing of like, oh my God, he might get caught. He might get what he deserves. And, and then I have to live with that moral dilemma and you've actually invoked a real emotion in me instead of me just screaming, what are we doing? And accidentally spitting on Laura. And they almost have Zoe do that. Because Zoe doesn't yes. buy it at first. But then she just buys it. And she just buys it. So the next scene we get we, it's another cut song, actually. Uh, people are... This is the one cut song nobody's really upset about. It's yeah. called To Break in a Glove. And it's Larry's big song. Okay. And it's him and Evan bonding over baseball. And uh, this is... If you've never seen the Sarah Smallwood Parsons, the song that no one likes. Yeah. We, uh, we plug it a lot on this show. I do. <laughs> it's, it's such a good musical theater joke. This is the song that nobody likes in Dear Evan Hansen. And Evan then lies to Larry about his dad, weirdly. He's like, oh, your dad must be so proud of you. And he's like, yeah, he is. And I don't understand this lie. I'm guessing that's just him being awkward. Yeah, because then, like, we see Evan text the picture of a signed baseball that he was looking at with Larry to his dad and be like, isn't this cool? And then you scroll up and you see that, like, Evan's dad leaves him on red. Yeah. And then Evan's mom sees the You Will Be Found video. Next note. Oh shit, my mom has the internet. Yeah, who would have guessed? And uh, she also snaps at Evan for skipping a therapy appointment. Mm -hmm. You you know those aren't free. Yeah. This is another trope I do not like. Things are looking up slightly for Evan. So he ditches mental health assistance. This is not how mental health works. You do not stop treatment because things are going slightly better for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's not really how it works. You might be working with a doctor to wean off anxiety if you anxiety meds if you think you can. Like if they were it was catalyzed by an event and you think like, okay, I think I can handle this and I can like be weaned off whatever. That's a conversation you have with your doctor. That's completely normal. You don't just be like, well, I'm done now. 
I super would have loved to have scenes of Evan in therapy and having a person that like he could tell the truth to who legally couldn't tell anyone else and how it would be handled. Yeah. That would be like it's a perfect reason to have Evan like out loud saying things like, I really think I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. But because we don't have that, Evan's just a douchebag. <laughs> So then, like, she's kind, like, his mother is kind of negligent, but she's very much trying. And I actually have the note of, I think they cut anybody have a map, because I think the movie wants us to have Evan's mom as an antagonist. Yes. In a very narrow-minded teenager way of, she's not around enough. Yeah, she's too busy making sure we don't starve to death and lose the house. Jerk. Because, like, we, like, from Evan's point of view, she kind of is an antagonist. And we'll see that a little bit more as the movie goes on. But if we start with anybody have a map, the audience kind of comes in feeling for her. Yeah. In a way that I don't think the movie necessarily wants us to. So then Zoe shows up uninvited to their house. Yeah. And he gets her some water. They kind of just talk. And then they go up to Evan's room. And we get the song Only Us. Yes. Again, in a vacuum, this is a lovely song. It is. But in the context of this show, there is no reason for Zoe to like Evan. It's it, also gross because her like her attraction to him is predicated on lies. Yeah. It's like he's pretending to be Prince Harry or something. Bum, bum, bum. No one would ever do that. We also get a montage of them dating that you weren't really sure... Yes, I found... like I thought this was a fantasy sequence. Yes. It's them at like a dance... It's them at an amusement park, and then there's, like, a third, like, place they go to. Then I'm like, oh, this is Evan imagining what would happen if they actually did date. But then it's implied that those things actually happened, which means somebody had to pay for the amusement park. Who would have done that? Oh, Zoe, because Evan's poor. Someone would have had to have rented Evan's suit. Who would have done that? Zoe, because Evan's poor. And his mom didn't notice. Yeah. Like... Well, we get the impression that Evan is constantly lying that he's with Jared. So he's just also telling garden variety lies to his mom. Oh, like... The fact that all of that is reality makes everything that much more confusing and makes kind of every character in the movie more stupid. And then we see, like, the change of Evan is now standing his mom up for Taco Tuesday because he's going to go hang out. He says he's at Jared's. He's hanging out with Zoe. And then we see another Connor Project meeting. And Evan is missing, and it's down to about, like, a third of the original people who were at the meeting. Which is very realistic. Mm-hmm. So Evan, whose entire life right now is predicated on piggybacking off this dead kid's legacy, mm-hmm. is not even dedicated enough to stick to that. Yeah. Um, a kid is dead, Evan. Yeah. He get, well, he, he's banging his sister. So he, his part that he wanted has happened and has succeeded. So then one day Evan and Zoe go back to the Murphys from a date. And oh no, Evan's mommy is at the Murphys. Zoe is delighted. Zoe runs up and hugs Evan's mom. Like, I'm so happy to finally meet you. And there's some banter among the Murphys about like Evan's favorite foods that they make. Like, oh, his favorite's my chicken Milanese. Nuh-uh, his favorite is my black bean burgers. Like, yeah, some like bickering over like Evan being part of their, fa- that really implies Evan's part of their family. Mm-hmm. And the bottle of wine they're sharing is sustainably made from the Napa Valley. Yeah. So like expensive wine. It's, yeah, it's making her feel really poor. And then Evan talks about an essay he wrote and she says something about Sulu and he's like, no, it's Sula. Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, Sulu's the character from Star Trek, you dumb poor. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I was going to make the same joke before Larry does, where I was just like, ah, Sulu, I know that. Um, but they, the- they then offer to, to give the money they had set aside for Connor, for college, to Evan. Because they know that Evan is looking at all these essays and trying to, like, doesn't know that he can necessarily pay for college. Yeah. 
And his mother flies off the handle. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm not going to accept money from strangers. And and then I have, yep, they had to cut anybody have a map because we like Heidi. And she's really unlikable in this scene. Because mm-hmm. her pride is very wounded. Yeah. And she's been feeling really disconnected from her son. And has essentially found out her son has been lying to her a lot, a lot. Yes. I'd like to, again, stress the fact that this is so secret would make his mom think Evan and Connor are gay. Yeah. Because, like, there's no reason to be hiding all this unless he felt like he had to. But the fact that that, that no one comes to that conclusion is weird. So then uh, Evan follows his mother outside, and they have a big fight about Evan's mental health and how he feels like a burden who has ruined her life. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And he's like, I'm your, she's like, I'm your mother. I'm sorry I can't give you more than that. And he goes, it's not my fault other people can. Yeah. Which is a douchebag thing to say. It's a nasty teenager thing to say. Mm-hmm. But like, what I'm kind of pointing out here is, by the end of the scene, I don't like anyone. Like, I'm not cheering for anyone. I was like, oh, you're terrible and you're terrible. Yeah. And, like, this is something we had discussed, was at this, uh, she says something like, "Um, I'm I'm sorry you're so uh, concerned about our finances. You could have come to a very nice conclusion there of, like, of course I am. Yeah. That's, you're always at work. And then the argument is, and it's a great argument because there's not a good solution of, you shouldn't be so worried about our finances. And it's like, well, you, everything you do makes me worried about our finances. You're, you're taking extra working. shifts. You're worried about getting fired. What a great reveal it would have been if Evan then said, this is why I don't order takeout. Yeah. Because it then recontextualizes everything of like, maybe he's not anxious. Maybe he doesn't need to be on these pills. Maybe he's just worried about money. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, including that line would have made me rethink everything I know about these characters. And it would have made sense. Yeah. But it's not there. Instead, it just makes everyone unlikable. The next scene is Alana in the library, and she kind of catches up with Evan, and she goes, Were you ever friends? Yes. We needed this so much earlier. And she says, like, you said you broke your arm in June. You still had a cast in September. Yes. And, like... The idea being, you know, oh, you had a cast in September and you didn't get it off for a while. Yeah. And she's like, you're also not going to the Connor Project. Like, if this was my best friend, I'd be doing everything for him. Mm -hmm. And then Evan does something terrible. Yeah. He emails Alana a picture of the note and uses it as evidence Connor did care about him. But then tells him she can't show it to anybody. Yeah, don't show this to anyone, but this is his suicide note that was written to me. And... We see, like, the mor- the memorial in front of Connor's locker is faded away. And Alana is sitting there. There's two days left in the Kickstarter. It's only three quarters funded. Mm-hmm. And in a fit of desperation, she posts the note yes. to the Connor Memorial uh, social media page. Yeah, this makes sense. Like, she has put her own value in whether or not this Kickstarter fails or succeeds. So... Of course she does this. And then the next thing that Evan does is call her when well, he sees that it's been posted. Yeah, because it blows up. And then donations go burr. Mm-hmm. And they're all at a party, and then everyone kind of looks at Zoe, who's been playing... Zoe's been playing guitar, not really mm-hmm. doing anything. And it turns out the whole family starts to blame... Or not the, Excuse me. Everyone starts to blame the family. Yes. For, like, why would a kid give the suicide note to his friend and not someone in his family... There's a terrible comment of, like, if that was my family, I'd kill myself, too. Yes. I find this very strange because I don't find it that unusual that a teenager would choose to give it to a friend over their family. Yeah. Like, teenagers do tend to, like, prioritize friends or yeah. romantic they, partners. They feel over like them. no one understands them. Yeah, like, especially not mom and dad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, everyone is going for blood at the family. And the family is arguing at their house, screaming at each other like, you know, oh, the mom just threw different treatments at the wall. They didn't try to stick to anything. Yes. And like, 
Like, the mom goes for blood. Like, you didn't love him because he wasn't yours. Because Larry's yeah. their stepfather. I, I have this quote. Uh, Larry says, stay calm. And she says, that's your solution to everything. There are very few problems where it's like, you know what the best thing to do is? Panic! Panic, Panic right now! Why aren't you panicking enough? So then Evan tries to console them and Evan tries to take the heat off them. And this is when we get words fail. Yes. I hate this song so much. He finally reveals that he is the one who wrote the letter. That it was an exercise that his therapist wanted him to do. Connor didn't write this. He was never friends with Connor. Everything he said was a lie. And words fail to uh, explain why he did this. But he says, you know, I had never had a family before. And I thought maybe I could be a part of this. That's not a worthy explanation, I know. Make sense of all these things I've done. Words fail, words fail. There's nothing I can say. Words fail, words fail. There's nothing. The way he says nothing makes me laugh every time. Um. So I have a note here that I, okay. that I think would fix this movie. Okay. They shouldn't believe him. Okay. They should all just look at him and be like, it's very nice of you to try to take responsibility for this. But we know you were friends with Connor. And it's very nice of you to try to like take all the heat on yourself so it gets off this family. But we know who we were as parents was not the greatest and we deserve this criticism. If you make the prison inescapable. Yeah, if you make it that no one believes him and, and he can't really... And like, now there's nothing he can do. He has to live this lie because even coming clean is not letting him escape. That's the punishment he deserves for yeah. what he did. Is to, like, live with it forever. Yeah, like, the lie is now bigger than him. So then, I, I have a note here. I'd love to watch footage of, like, live audiences who didn't know who thought this was... Because so many people thought this was, like, a Love, Simon type movie. Yes. So I'd love to watch the footage of people being like, what is happening? Yeah, I, I think we should mention... Uh, I know we've brought this up on previous podcasts, but I think we need to bring it up again. I almost bought you tickets to Dear Evan Hansen. Yes, and I knew what it was about. I didn't. <laughs> and I didn't tell you, but I went like, oh, I really don't want to see Dear Evan yeah, Hansen. Yeah, so, uh, well, I just called Laura and I was like, hey, I'm working on your uh, Christmas present. Just keep this day open. And her response was, okay, but I don't want to see Dear Evan Hansen. And I was crushed. And I was like, that's what we were going to do. You're always singing the music. And you're like, the music's good. The play's not very good. And I didn't give you, I did not give you follow-up details. You did not. I can't imagine sitting in a theater <laughs> with real people and having to stop. I would have been freaking out in the theater. I, like, there's no way I didn't burst out laughing at some point watching this. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Like, you would not have made it through this. No. So... Um, the family's like kicks Evan out at this point. Yeah. And, and by that, you mean Amy Adams goes, I think it's time for you to go. Yeah. <laughs> Very nicely. But like, to the family, you've got to figure it means the only human parts of Connor were lies. And he essentially, to all three of them, dies all over again. The image of Connor as having a sensitive and sweet side. That he showed to Evan and not them mm -hmm. dies again. Yeah. Evan or Connor now was the monster Zoe knew. Mm hmm. Uh, Zoe tells Evan to go away at school the next day, and Evan's like, I'm gonna come clean. And Zoe's like, No. Uh, my mom says she doesn't want you to ruin your life, and she doesn't want you to do something stupid. She's already lost one son. Yes. So I guess Cynthia pretty intelligently is like, This kid's mentally ill. Mm hmm. The trauma from coming clean could kill this boy. Yes. 
so then Evan like runs out of school, goes to the state park where he actually broke his arm, yes. not the orchards, and ugly cries. He like his face is so purple. He looks horrible in this. And we find out as an audience, the broken arm was a botched suicide attempt. Yes, which I'm sorry. This makes Evan so stupid that he thought falling out of a tree would kill him. (laughs) I mean, I think it fits the theme of kids doing rash acts and not thinking them through entirely. Zoe with the car, Alana posting the note. Um, Like this, Connor, the way Connor passes away. All of these are rash acts that are not completely thought through. Mm -hmm. So I think this is supposed to be one more in a line of like teenagers doing rash things. So then the next scene we see his mom coming home to a dark house. And I hate this sequence because this sequence is clearly setting up his mother finding his body. Yeah. Like, Evan, Evan, and everything is dark. Yes. And I was like, this feels like... Uh, it feels like the scene in Heather's when Heather and uh, Veronica's mom finds her in the closet. Yeah. Uh, but instead, she opens the door to find him, like, sitting on his bedroom floor crying. Yes, next to the lounge chair that's in his room. I just want to point this out. He's poor. But he has a full-on lounge chair next to his bed in his room. Like he lives in a hotel. He comes clean about everything. And then... His mom, that's how his mom finds out that he was suicidal. Mm -hmm. And then she sings so big, so small. And this is clearly, we cut anybody have a map because it would make her likable. This is clearly the pathos where like we find out Evan's mom has been trying really hard the whole time. Like Evan's mom has been trying to keep them together since Evan's dad left. And at the end of the song is the worst acting choice. Mm-hmm. I've ever seen. Ben Platt throws himself at Julianne Moore with a ferocity that made us think he was going to try to make out with her. Yes, because they're more similar in age. But, but, but yeah, it looks like they're about to kiss and we audibly screamed in the theater. Yes, we did. We were like, <laughs> oh, oh, no. It's, it's so poorly shot. Everything about this is so bad. It's so bad. So then, um, Evan videos himself, posts it to Instagram, and outs himself as a liar. Two things. Yes. One, he shoots himself like he's a damn supervillain. Like, half of his face is orange, and the other half of his face is in darkness. And two, it's the one thing that Connor's parents didn't want to happen. Yeah. After all you did, you couldn't honor their last wish? What are you doing? Yeah. So, Evan murders Connor's memory. Yeah. Cool. So then... uh, It gets funded somehow. (laughs) Well, it got funded before. Yeah. Like, it got funded when Alana posted the note. Yes. So then Evan decides to dedicate his summer to really learning things about Connor. So he is reading all of Connor's favorite books. Yeah, he reads Ready Player One. Because no one at school will speak to him anymore. We do see them graduate. And we see Evan contacting everyone who went to rehab with Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, His favorite books are Cat's Cradle, Ready Player One, uh, Persepolis, The Client by John Grisham. That's a weird one. And Perks of Being a Wallflower, which is a very, I see what you did there. It's written by the guy who directed. Oh. Um, it, was, it was an advertisement. Yeah. It's written by the director of the film. So, uh, Evan finally gets a lead on Connor. And he sends Connor, uh, excuse me, Evan finally gets a lead on Connor. And the lead sends Evan a video. Yes. He makes three USB drives of the video and mails them to... Jared, Alana, and the Murphy family. Why does he send it to Jared? I don't know. I thought that was weird, too. And this is all over Ben Platt singing one more song called Closer. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we see of this sequence is 
the Murphy family watching the video. And they discussed that Connor played guitar, but no one had ever heard him. And it's Connor singing this song he had written. Yes. The song that Ben Platt had just been singing. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be honest, it's, it's, it's a nice song. And it's a moment where we see, like, the Murphy family really start to finally heal. Mm-hmm. So then we get one last scene, and it's Zoe's Jeep pulling up to the orchard, and she meets Evan there. She's wearing a cute dress. She's starting college in two weeks. So she's their age, which I thought she was younger. Yeah, that's a really good point. Which would mean that, I mean, I could totally buy that Connor had been left had back. Had been left back, maybe, yeah. Um, so maybe Zoe is Evan's age, and Connor had been left back at some point. Yeah, because he had to go to rehab and stuff like that. That kind of makes sense. I mean, Connor had had problematic behavior as far back as second grade. Yeah. So maybe he started school late because they tried to have, like, one more year to, like, socialize him. And uh, Evan's taking a gap year. He's taking classes at the community college, and he's going to try to get a job and save up for college. Yeah. Uh, Zoe wanted to make sure that Evan saw the orchard. She's like, Connor really did love it here, and my family's been having picnics here every weekend. Yeah. Kind of this, like, hey, you dug this hole. Yeah. You need to see through the end of it. I mean, there's a there's a line in here that I really don't even think is appropriate to have kept, which is, I always picture you and Connor here. And Evan responds, this is my first time here. And it's like, like, you're just, if I was Zoe, I would just get mad all over again. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's right. You lied to me about everything. Everything I fantasize is a lie. I hate you. It just, it doesn't honor the story at all. There's also a line where she says, like, I wish we met now for the first time today. Yes. I'm like, why? Why would you want... There There needed to be at least one scene where it turns out they've both liked the same movie. It was just like, oh my God, you liked Airplane 2? Just something that made them have something in common that wasn't Connor. Because when you remove Connor, they had nothing to do with each other. They just needed a moment where they're together. Where they connect on something that's not Connor. Yes! Oh. It's so... This movie is so frustrating. And then it ends. (laughs) Yes, like... We close on Evan writing a final letter to himself of like... Today's a good day. You're gonna be yourself. No lies. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like he did not suffer enough for his choices. Yeah. I kind of feel like he just gets away with it. Because, like, what really is his punishment? Oh, no one talks to him. No one talked to him before. Yeah. Like, it's kind of like if you committed a crime and then you had a really good time and then you just go back to normal. It's like you still got to have that fun ride. Yeah. Going back to normal is not punishment. It's the status quo. And like the fact that, and I know I'm harping on this, but that's what the whole movie's based on. The fact that when people do start waving at him, that he doesn't know how to properly respond to it, means he's just a douchebag not worth waving to. Oof. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing with this is it's... And and one of the things I find wild about this is Ben Platt has been pretty public about struggling with anxiety. So Ben Platt knows that anxiety doesn't really look like this. Yeah. Most people with anxiety are still, like, living in this world. Like, they're more in line with Alana. Mm-hmm. Of, there's so many... The anonymous ones... Uh, like, you know, when you get to really talking about mental health with your friends, most people under 40 mention having at least a time period of depression or anxiety. Mm-hmm. Even if they don't suffer from it long term, they'll be able to point to a time where they were like, oh, I was very depressed or very anxious mm-hmm. at this like period of my life, mm-hmm. whether I was able to seek help or whether it was unavailable to me for, you know, financial or logistical reasons. Most people have gone through something like that. 
So the attitudes of this film toward mental health are abominable. Yeah, because, I mean, like, I have anxiety about th- certain things. You have anxiety about certain everything. things. Everything. Everyone has anxiety. But no, see, that's the thing I want to correct. It's not everything. Every single human being I've spoken to about anxiety says, this sets off my anxiety. They have a thing that they can point to that's like, this is one of the things that triggers it. What triggers Evan's anxiety? The answer to that is everything. And that makes it unrealistic. Right. Like, if he, if he was also shown with like, this is my safe space, where like, I can just, too many other people play the guitar. But, like, where I can play my Game Boy or, you know, knit or do a thing. Yeah, like, everybody also has that thing they do to cope. To cope. He has no coping mechanisms. Yeah, like... And that's what makes it so unrealistic as a character. Like, you don't see him... They, we have this informed attribute of him writing. He's a good writer. His high school teacher thinks he's a good writer. We never see him, like, write in a journal. No. We never see him... He struggles through the letters. Yeah. He's not good at them. And I'm like, you would think that, like, this could be, you know, like, Evan's a writer. Fake a diary. Yeah. Fake a journal. Like, and I know that's monstrous, but, like, backdate a journal. Rough up a notebook. The, the fact that he doesn't have a coping mechanism makes it unrealistic. Except for one thing that might be considered the coping mechanism. Let's go back to the scene where he's doing drugs on the floor. It's the only time where he's like, I am facing anxiety. I'm going to do the thing that makes me better. It's drugs. What is the message of drugs in this film? Yeah. Because by the end of the movie, it's not that he's not taking them anymore. They're just no longer a plot point. So what's happening? Yeah. This movie's a mess. This movie is a hot mess. Uh, the musical was extremely well received um, when it came out. The musical, not the mm-hmm. film. Uh, the musical won the Tony over uh, Come From Away and Great Comet of 1812. Yes. And people are still mad. Um, the musical has not aged super well. Like, if, you, if you're serious, like, if I'm being, if I could be serious for a moment, uh, if you put the CD on in the car... It's really good music. I do love the music. The songs are awesome in this. And what's weird about them is you won't really get what that movie's or what this play's about. No. Based off of the soundtrack. No. May, like maybe Sincerely Me would give it away, but you you could take someone who's never heard anything about Dear Evan Hansen, put in the soundtrack, and they will leave going, I want to see this. And then when they see it, they will be horrified. That's literally what happened to me. The first things I knew about this show were waving through a window, Mm -hmm. which is a pretty good feeling of what it feels like to be an outsider and not be able to, like, connect. Uh, You Will Be Found, which at face value is a very beautiful song about, like, Mm -hmm. not being alone. And Only Us, Mm -hmm. which in a vacuum. And this was, like, immediately after the election of 2016. Yeah. So a lot of people were feeling like very scared about the future. And that song, Only Us, about shutting out the world and just being with your partner, Mm -hmm. connected with a lot of people. And then like I had some difficult family situations and Requiem felt really like a version of Requiem's release that cut Larry and Cynthia's part and only was the actress playing Zoe at the time singing in front of a band. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that version. And then I looked up the plot one day. And went, oh, no. (laughs) And so I just, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to like sit through it. Mm -hmm. So instead of Dear Evan Hansen that year, I believe you took me to see Rent. Yeah, we saw Rent that year. Which was also really funny because I I know Rent inside out, backwards, forwards, Mm -hmm. because I was a theater child of a certain age. Mm -hmm. Um, You were less familiar with the storyline of Rent? No, the songs were just shouted at me. And that is my experience of Rent, is people very aggressively... Shouting three of the songs. Shouting La Bibo M or uh, 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 the the Cyberland. Over the Moon. Yeah, just at me. Oh, yeah, you went to a performing arts high school that had to be... Damn right. It had to be lousy with kids singing Over the Moon. Oh, yeah. I have a cute, funny La Bibo M story. Uh, One year, I was a camp counselor at a theater camp. It was an, an arts camp. 
but I was one of the theater counselors. And I'm facing away from the other students, like at the counselor's table. And I hear, la vie bohème. And I'm like, oh no, oh no. And my co-counselor goes, do we do something? And I was like, it's fine. Let's just hope none of them gets on the table. Because mm-hmm. Mark gets up on the table. This is the moment that word leaves my lips. Uh, I turn around and there's a kid on the lunch table. I was like, why, nope. is, it, I was like, why is it always our kids? And the creative writing instructor looked at me and went, well, what do you think is going to be mine? <laughs> yeah. So every time I think of like, and that was, you know, Rent was already like over a decade old at that point. Mm-hmm. But Rent's fallen out of fashion just because generationally uh, the work ethic of the characters in Rent has not aged great. Yeah. Like now with Generation Side Hustle. Yeah. They'd be like, well, Roger could really do something. Yes. I have so many feelings about Rent that I will save for another time. Yeah. It's very much that like the trend. I'm talking about Rent because it was like the trendy teen musical before Spring Awakening, which was the trendy teen musical before Dear Evan Hansen. Yeah. Which was the trendy uh, teen musical before Be More Chill. Be More Chill. Yeah. (laughs) And now it's Heathers. And now it's Six. Oh, yeah. I like six. So, so uh, any any fun trivia that you want to? Uh, no, give I think us I went this? over a lot of. Okay, we went over a lot in this one, so I think I'm gonna. The only note that I have is how great would this be if at intermission it turned out that Connor faked his death. Yeah. And he comes back and he's like, "What the hell is all this?" <laughs> Well, in the there is a book tie-in. You know, that's some trivia we're going to get into. Okay. There is a book tie-in. And in the book tie-in, which people debate whether it's canon or not. Right. Connor is gay and oh. does have a relationship. Oh. Uh, because really the musical does Connor dirty. Yes. That's one of my major problems with this. Is that Connor is really a MacGuffin of a human being. Mm-hmm. He is a plot point. He's a sexy lamp. And... We never really learn anything truly redeeming about Connor. So the argument bit kind of becomes, well, he was a jerk. Yeah. Like, and that's such a problematic, horrible message. Mm-hmm. Of like, oh, no, this kid really did suck. Yeah, I think it's done on purpose so we don't hate Evan. It's like, you know, it, the, his legacy that Evan has built is much better than anything that Connor would have done on his own. Yeah. So he's receiving more flowers than he ever would have. I think that's the idea behind it. It's still gross, but I think that's why it's done like this. I mean, I don't know why you would make this movie, uh, to be honest. Uh, Because I don't... In the end, I think this is my biggest problem. I don't think this movie says anything. Yeah. Like, in the end, everything just kind of goes back to normal. The end of this movie is basically how it would have ended if Evan had never intervened, except now there's an apple orchard. Yeah. And you know how I feel about apple orchards. Yeah, I knew that was coming. So, what's the verdict? To me, it's it's a big old stay doomed. As Like, it's a negative seven, but it's a stay doomed. It's a stay doomed for me. That being said... If you want to listen to the soundtrack on Spotify, that's a stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. The I do good. really like the music in this. Uh, where where does it rank in your Razzie list? Um, honestly, it's second to Diana. Second to Diana. I have more fun with Diana. So you think Diana is more worthy of worst picture than... Yeah. Um, in that thing of like, it was the most enjoyable worst picture to me. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, where is it in your list of musicals we've covered? Because we covered Spider-Man on the Patreon, and we've covered Cop Rock, along with Diana and Dear Evan Hansen. Since Dear Evan Hansen has one competent element, it's on top. Okay. Because the music is at least competent. Um, Diana, the musical's not very. The music's not very good either. It's just cheesy enough to be more fun. Yeah. Uh, Cop Rock, nothing is competent. And uh, Turn Off the Dark, also no. I felt like going in, I was like, I think out of those four, Dear Evan Hansen is my favorite. Because it's the one I would want to watch again. And now having watched it again, not that great. Yeah. (laughs) So so maybe The magic of that, like... 
the magic of that time when we were watching it in the theater, mm-hmm. I think was a big reason we did really love it. Because mm-hmm. this is a really fun movie to watch with a group of other people. Yes. Uh, who have no reservations about being a little bit terrible. Yes. Because it... it is a bit of a darker film to make fun of because there's so many themes of suicide, but it's handled so poorly that you can't help but laugh at it. Uh, so yeah, I, I recommend throwing it on with some friends a lot. Yeah. And that's going to do it for Dear Evan Hansen. Thank you so much for our patrons for voting for this one. And speaking of Patreon voting, it's time for more Patreon votes. Here are your choices for April's Patreon Select. Because remember, this was a Patreon Select yeah. episode. So here's April's choices for you. Uh, returning, because they were runner-ups last time. It is YouTube Live, which is a 2008 YouTube spectacular. It is the jackassworld.com 24-hour takeover of MTV, a very unique one that we wouldn't normally do here on the show, but we thought it would be fun and weird. And then our next two... Are one is a four in one. Yes, a four it is in one. four different half length pilots that WWE Network tried to shop out. Yes, we are not going to be covering WrestleMania. We covered WrestleMania for various reasons and for the past. last two years during the pandemic. Yes, but uh, we don't have a real good reason to cover this year's WrestleMania. So if you want something wrestling related, you vote for the WWE pilots. That will give you. Kitchen Smackdown, hosted by Bo, Bo Dallas. Dallas. Botch Club, voted, or, uh, hosted by uh, the Bullet Club, uh, or the Good Brothers. Xavier's Arcade Challenge, which is Xavier Woods filmed down the street from us. And most importantly... Most importantly... The Fashion Files Cold Case Unit, yes. starring... The Fashion Police. Yes. Tyler Breeze and Fandango. And Fandango. So we'll cover all four of those. If yeah. Choose those because they're only like 15 minutes long. And our next is a, uh, and our next, our last one is called Next. It is a Fox pilot from 2002 with Bob Odenkirk, Fred Armisen, and Zach Galifianakis. Excellent. And Brian Persane. So your choices are WWE pilot Next, the WWE, no, I'm sorry, the Jackass World Takeover or YouTube Live. You can vote for that now on our Patreon at Stay doomed. Where can people find us? You can email us at the Stay Doomed Show at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Stay Doomed. And if you are waving through a window, I'm at Plus Two Comedy. But if words fail, I'm at Bean Bunny Lives. Until next time, stay doomed. <laughs>